Hi, and welcome to What's Up Williston. We are back after our pandemic hiatus. I'm your host, Eric Wells, town manager in Williston. We have a great show lined up to kick off our third season and our return. Each month on this program, we'll take a look at what's going on in town and hear from the many members that shape our community. So first off this month, at Town Meeting 2022, the community supported a fiscal year 2023 budget that included the addition of nine new full-time firefighter and EMT positions to help meet the operational needs for emergency service delivery in town. This need was identified by the town after it completed a comprehensive analysis of the department's services um, in 2011 by the consulting firm AP Triton. So the town had over 50 applications for these new positions that were filled in April, and the nine recruits recently wrapped up an intensive eight-week training academy. I sat down with our fire captain, Prescott Nadu, who led our training effort to discuss the recruit academy and what it involved. Here's an inside look. So I wanna welcome back Captain Prescott Nadu to the show. Welcome back, Prescott. Thanks for having me. So the Wilson Fire Department just completed a recruit academy for nine new firefighters EMTs that wrapped up uh, just last week. And Captain Nadeau um, led the efforts in the training at the recruit academy. So he's come by to chat about it a little bit today. And I, I thought we could just start out by just sharing with folks, uh, what is a recruit academy and, and why was it important for, for operations for, for our new personnel? Sure. Um, probably one of the most exciting things I've done in my career um, a recruit academy, especially one of such large um, numbers with nine people going through it, um, is meant to be foundational skills. So we want people, uh, we want to bring people, even if they have past experience in other departments or agencies, we want to bring people down to that very most basic level of what is a fire hose and how do you use it, you know, how, you know taking blood pressures on patients and pulses and things like that. Um, we realized early on in hiring, not this nine, but groups before this even, that in order to hire the right people, we cannot base it simply on certification. Hmm. Although getting folks with high levels of certification, such as advanced EMT or paramedic, is great, uh, we want the right people. And oftentimes, uh, those are folks, uh, as we found in this academy, energetic, geared up, um, young, old, it doesn't matter. We just want them to start off on a level playing field, which at the end of the day is exactly what the Recruit Academy does. So it really sounds a lot about, we have people coming from different experiences, different certification levels, but we're really talking about building a team and letting people know what we do in Williston. Oh, absolutely. And uh, you, you, I think you nailed it with that statement, building a team, because the recruits came in on day one, expecting eight weeks later to have all of the skills necessary to, uh, you know, fight fires, cut cars apart and vehicle electrications and serve the public in an EMS capacity. But what they didn't realize is throughout every single one of those weeks that built on each other, um, teamwork was uh, really one of the core concepts that we wanted to ingrain in them. And that was 100% uh, evident at the uh, at week eight. So maybe you could share, uh, what are some team building exercises the group did? Um, some things that come to mind. Sure. I mean, early, <laughs> early on, we were not yet out into the field. And so we did the whole two truths and a lie game where, you know, everyone around needs to come up with uh, two truths and then one lie based on them person personally. So what that allowed us to do is in a relatively amusing manner, we were able to uncover a lot of neat things about each other. Um, incumbent staff participated as well as the recruits. Um, and then that very same, in that very same vein, we also were able to do uh, an activity related to, uh, you had spaghetti, some string and some tape, and you needed to create the tallest structure in a, a time allotment. Um, and uh, they were split into two groups. Uh, they needed to accomplish that uh, uh, utilizing, again, we didn't tell them any of this, but teamwork being a, a core uh, skill in that is to come together and not, not you know, try to assert a level of power or leadership so much as let's come together, toss some ideas around, see what works best. Uh, and at the end of that time, you know, the, the team that had the tallest st structure uh, you know, simply one praise, but it was pretty neat to be able to see how the dynamics work. Hmm. I can certainly see where, you know, getting to know each other from, um, you know, a team building standpoint when we're delivering emergency services in town, 
Uh, that communication fa factor <clears throat> is huge. Maybe you could just talk about, you know, what we're not on the fire ground or responding to an EMS call, how that, you know, knowing your team and the communication plays into all that. Absolutely. Uh, we, so we had a whole day, uh, eight hours focused on communication, but the irony of that communications day was that was mostly focused on logistics and radio traffic and things of that nature. When in reality, uh, every single day that they came in, there was additional features of the communications, the lecture that came forth. So uh, being able to know each other, know each other's skill level, what we are and are not capable of, um, and being able to own up to that. If there's things that I am not good at that others are, I will learn from them and, and, and sort of yield to them uh, so their strengths come out uh, and they can improve my weaknesses. Uh, and we, as a group, the recruits especially, really came together uh, to discover that in each other. Uh, and by week eight, it was very evident that they were helping each other out. Something uh, exceptionally um, important that occurred is instead of, identifying a weakness and then exploiting it to make themselves look better. They identified weaknesses in each other and helped each other out. They were able to, in many cases, overcome uh, phobias or fears, um, or at least lessen them to a point where uh, when they broke into smaller groups, groups of three, um, they were able to work very, very well together. Hmm. That's great. It's, um, you know, as I think about this, I know you, you put in many, many hours to, to plan this ahead of time. You know, we're, we're talking eight weeks of really day by day, hour by hour, well focused with all the different aspects of, of training to build the team, but then the technical pieces as well, learning our departments. Um, how, how did you approach that? And, you know, what were going into it? What, what were the what were the goals to cover? So it was uh, it was a challenge. I will I will say when I said it was one of the most um, amazing things that I've done in my career, it also was one of the most challenging. Uh, simply because for the Williston Fire Department, nothing like this has ever occurred. Nine people in a recruit academy at the same time. Uh, we've you know the highest number of recruits we've had in any academy was three. Mm -hmm. um, and so the initial approach was to find, uh, basically not reinvent the wheel. We wanted to find curriculum that already existed. Um, so in utilizing um, a very similar curriculum that the Vermont State Firefighter One program uses, uh, we followed that same exact uh, uh, curriculum. So the PowerPoints were already built out. The lectures were already built out. We as the incumbent staff and myself as the lead simply needed to um, get that out to the instructors ahead of time so they could practice uh, and, and prepare for their respective lecture days. Um, the reason we did that was simply because it, it's, it's not reinventing the wheel and it's tried and true. We know from, you know, hundreds of firefighters throughout the state that they've gone through the curriculum, that same curriculum, uh, and, and come out at the end, um, you know, very knowledgeable, able to perform the job well. Um, the one additional thing we did, which I'm extremely happy that we had a chance to do, is we worked in very close concert with our uh, friends at the Burlington Fire Department. Um, mere months before we started our Academy of Nine, they had just completed an Academy of, um, I actually believe, Nine. Um, and so figuring out what worked for them, what didn't work for them, we were able to uh, make some game day decisions uh, or I shouldn't even say game day. It was, it was long before the Recruit Academy started um, to to make our program that much more robust. Uh, I know they were they were a great partner throughout this, and you know it's great to have a, um, a peer agency that we rely on for mutual aid as well to be to be engaged. And it was great to see them at the graduation ceremony as well. That that was fun, and, and Eric, I can I can say uh, publicly because it's very amusing that um, it started they almost at the same timeline, they had a recruit academy going, uh, not quite nine, this, this recruit academy was uh, five, uh, but they were both called Recruit School 2201, respectively Burlington and Williston. And so a, a little rivalry, I'll call it, when in reality it was more fun than anything else. Sure. Um, we sent each other little jokes back and forth and uh, were able to host them as they were able to host us for a number of uh, evolutions culminating with our final week, uh, we went to the Vermont Fire Academy for live fire training uh, together. And there was no 
a better way to build a group up and, and, and have that cohesion um, across town lines than uh, fighting fire together, actually, in a training atmosphere. And that's what I want to get into a little bit next. I, I know folks watching are probably thinking, okay, I can picture, you know, building a team, doing some classroom learning, but then there, there's such a wide spectrum of hands-on and, and fire EMS services. And um, if you want to go through some of these um, uh, training exercises that were covered and maybe the, the live fire is a, a good place to start. Sure, sure. And it's, it's, it's neat because that was the culminating activity. Um, and so what that did was that encompassed, it was week eight, and it encompassed almost every single discipline that we had taught them up to that point as it relates specifically to firefighting, uh, ground ladder work, uh, work with hose lines and water supply, um, civilian victim rescue in a smoky environment, search and rescue, things like that, all were able to be done in a controlled atmosphere to prepare the recruits. Uh, in some cases, some of them hadn't done any activities like that in years. Um, others, you know, have been doing the job for a long time, but this was able, like I had said earlier, to get everyone on that sit, uh, same playing field, um, but do so in that culminating manner. When, when you um, throw a ground ladder or perform a search and rescue operation in our fire station, it's quite a bit different than when you are down at the fire academy and there is actually um, something on fire in a room, a real smoke condition, visibility issues, and you're having to then engage in those same training functions. And I believe you went through, was it 13 different um, scenarios? I, I may have the term wrong, but uh, you know, that's, that's, that was quite a few as I understand it. Yes, yeah, our, our recruits in conjunction with Burlington's were, it was unbelievable. Uh, what ended up occurring was 13, as you said, 13 scenarios, evolutions, um, which was three shy of an academy record oh. uh, for the largest number of scenarios ever, uh, you know, spun up for, for a, a group of, of recruits in this case. Um, and that's just a testament to their hard work. Um, they, you know, I at the time was, was, you know, working in close concert with the academy staff to make sure we didn't overdo it. Um, but they were ready and they wanted more. They, you know, yes, at the very end of the day, I'm sure they were exhausted. Um, I was exhausted. Uh, however, just seeing them, even at the end of the day, after all the work was done and everything was cleaned up, they were happy. They were smiling. They were excited to have just completed that. So when you're going into a, an evolution like that, a scenario, um, that they don't know what they're going into, right? They're, it's just like responding to a call. Yes. And that's exactly, we uh, had it dispatched out um, on our radio frequency. We were able to then uh, assign crews to certain roles, uh, you know, fire suppression, victim search and rescue, uh, uh, ventilation, functions of that nature. Um, however, what was really neat to see is as occurs in real life on a, on a fire ground or emergency scene of any nature, things were very dynamic. Um, you know, I had a piece of paper in front of me that had the scenarios from, from A to Z list, you know, listed exactly what was going to occur. And I don't think any single scenario went exactly as it was planned on the piece of paper. Um, but not only did we, the incumbent staff, overcome that very quickly, but the most impressive thing was um, the, the recruit. Uh, working with Burlington, uh, both their recruits and ours were able to, to uh, really handle any of those changes very well. So, so that was the culminating factor. I mean, there's a couple other um, training exercises you, you might want to share that, that the group went through. Yes, yeah. So uh, one of the pictures that we'll share here in just a second is uh, we'll start with um, early on in the Recruit Academy, uh, we had some fire behavior lectures. So this picture here is of the fire chief um, performing a, a, a live fire exercise with a, a dollhouse. It's called the Palmer dollhouse. And in essence, what this is, is we set a small fire in a, a OSB dollhouse uh, to teach them, show them what ventilation does to a structure, how fire travels through a building, things of that nature. Um, and, and that was a really neat opportunity for them to gain some knowledge in a, in a, a very controlled atmosphere. Um, sort of similar than taking that to a next level, 
the next photo here is is uh, we, what we were able to do. We have a prop outside of our fire station that allows firefighters to practice cutting holes in roofs for mm -hmm. ventilation to get the smoke and hot gases product of combustion out of a building so firefighters can see uh, and also victims hopefully will be able to um, uh, you know, breathe better basically uh, to, to get us in there and rescue them. So we were able to practice utilizing all of our own equipment, ladders, saws, uh, every, you know, everything like that. Um, some of the really neat one-off classes we, we we basically did a, a week of uh, engine company operations so dressing fire hydrants for getting water from a fire hydrant um, utilizing the different size fire hoses in different capacities um, we did another week that involved rapid intervention training so i'll show you a picture here in just a moment um, this picture is actually of a firefighter um, rescuing another firefighter out of a window um, and that can be uh, it is very physically intense I also happened to be one of those odd weeks that was extremely hot so the recruits did an amazing job overcoming uh, a combination of the heat and the physical stress of rescuing another firefighter practicing techniques to in this case the photo i'm going to show you is this, this um lowering another firefighter after having them uh, brought out of a uh, window um, and then the uh, one of the last photos uh, I'll show you here. This one is of uh, vehicle extrication. So we then migrated more towards instead of a full week devoted towards, um, like I said, engine company operations or firefighter rescue rapid intervention training. We then had sort of one or two days. In this case, uh, this picture is of one of three vehicles that we were able to cut apart to train firefighters how to rescue people if they become trapped in a vehicle on the roadway. Um, again, able to utilize our friends at the Burlington Fire Department. We hosted the, the class. Burlington brought an instructor and who's extremely knowledgeable and was able to help our recruits in that regard. Um, and then something, you know, uh, I, I don't have a photo, but I, I do want to talk very briefly, um, as, as morbid as it is to go down this road, the uh, events that have occurred in Buffalo and Uvalde, Texas, um, really affected the entire nation. And we were in the midst of this recruit school when a lot of that, uh, was occurring. One of the classes that was already on the docket to occur, but just took a much different meaning was something called TECC or Tactical Emergency Casualty Care. Um, that was a two-day class hosted with our colleagues over at the Global Foundries facilities um, in which we brought in some law enforcement members and we were able to train for scenarios um, of that nature that involve EMS entering what's called a hot zone uh, or an area where there might be um, extreme danger involving potentially an active shooter type situation and uh, administer emergency medical care in a rapid fashion. Um, so as more as that is, it's encouraging to know that our recruits, even at their very most foundational skills, have received critical training of that nature. Yeah, it's you know, just reflecting again on everything they've, they've gone through their training, and I have the, I have the privilege of watching um, part of this training, too, is just... Uh, you know, it's a testament to the people we have here um, in our department and, and our, um, including our, our new recruits here. Um, as you mentioned, we had a number of um, our staff sharing their, their skills and knowledge as teachers in this academy. So um, just, a, just a great um, experience for our department. And I think we're, we're just about out of time, but then any, any last uh, things I, I didn't ask you to share quickly? The last thing I want to cover is one of the most critical, uh, simply because it's impressive to me as always, and that's just the physical fitness component. Mm. Uh, and the members right from day one, PT almost every single day for, for at least half hour, 45 minutes. Um, it's, it's a component of our job that often goes under recognized simply because, oh, firefighters, they must be fit, right? Uh, well, these recruits are very fit after their eight weeks of, of mm. continuous PT. Uh, but one of the most exciting things we were able to do is work with our friends at the rehab gym to do a fitness assessment at the beginning and the end of the recruit school to show how, just how much progress uh, having a physical fitness regimen um, actually, you know, what, what, what progress that does. 
Um, and so in this case, you know, marked improvement was noted, uh, injury reduction, and, and hopefully at the end of the day, if these recruits are able to keep that trend of physical fitness, uh, which I do very much believe they will, uh, uh, they will be that much better able to serve the public. Hmm. That's great. Another great community partner to, to work with here. But we're out of time for today, but Prescott, thanks for coming back on the program now that we're, now that we're back here. And uh, thanks for all you do and, and for a great recruit academy that just wrapped up. Thank you, sir. It was, it was our pleasure. Graduation on June 10th, the nine new firefighters GMT, um, EMTs joined 24-hour department shifts earlier this week. Their addition increases the shift size from four to seven to provide fire and EMS services to our community. Next this month, summer is upon us and the Dorothy Allen Memorial Library is gearing up for its annual summer reading program. I sat down with Youth Services Librarian Bonnie Lord to learn more. So I'm back with Bonnie Lord, our Youth Services Librarian at the Dorothy Allen Memorial Library. Thanks for coming on the show, Bonnie. Thank you for inviting me, Eric. So we know schools are wrapping up, people are gearing up for summer and a, a big, um, offering we have every at the library is our summer reading program. So I thought uh, we would chat about that. And um, one of the things people always ask about is the theme. So maybe, sorry, what, what's the theme for this year? Yeah, so this year, and um, luckily we're able to participate through the Vermont Department of Libraries. Our theme is the Oceans of Possibilities. Mm -hmm. And as you can imagine, there are a lot of ocean and water themed um, events and books and things that we have going on for that theme because it's such a, a fun one to think about in the summer. So um, if you want to kind of walk everybody through how it's how it's set up this year, how it's how's it structured, and I, I know there's an app to use and uh, youth and adults can get involved, it sounds like. Yeah, so this year, summer reading at the libraries for all ages, uh, we have two different challenges set up. So one of them is zero through 16. Um, and the other one is for 16 plus. So that would be our adults one. The adults challenge is set up with reading books by genre or type. So some of them might be, you know, read a beach novel or read a book that has been turned into a movie. And with the adult one, you can enter into raffles to win um, different gift cards to restaurants in the area. There's also the opportunity to win ice cream cones from Adam's Farm through the adult challenge. The youth challenge is a little bit different. So we have uh, more challenging or more challenges involved in that. So each week we challenge youth to read a minimum of half an hour, which is pretty easy um, from all of the visits I made at Allenbrook School and Williston Central School. All the kids that I talked to seem pretty sure they can meet that challenge. Oh. And each week that they do that, they get a brag tag and then they also get virtual tickets for the raffles. Um, we have challenges set up to read four hours and each time you hit four hours um, as the mile marker, you get a new prize. So it starts with a free book and then it will go to going into the treasure chest to get a treat out of that and then a free ice cream cone from Adam's Farm and that cycle keeps repeating for each four hours. Um, the difference this year, so we are including audiobooks. We're including if you read to a family member or if a family re uh, member reads to you, that counts as reading. Graphic novels, uh, books you might read independently, so there's a lot of different ways that kids can participate in this. And then we have a midway raffle in July for some of the prizes, which they'll see on the app. And then we also have an end of summer raffle. So all of this is done on the Beanstack app, which we started using during the pandemic, and we've transferred to using it completely for the summer reading challenge. Mm -hmm. You can find the link to that on the uh, Dorothy Alling Memorial Library website. And when you register, it'll show you the adult and the youth one. It's really great. You can do all of your tracking online. You can do it on the app if you prefer. You can even set up family accounts. So if you have multiple kids in the family, you still only need one email address to do it. Sounds really easy to do. <laughs> uh, it's good. Um, yeah, well, so folks, if they want to get involved, well, the best thing to do is um, talk at the library, download the app. What, you know, what would you recommend folks to take for the next step to, to get signed up here? Definitely register online. You can do that at any point, any time of the day, uh, just by going to the library website and following the link there. But once they do register, especially for the youth, I want to encourage them to come talk to us because just for registering, the youth get to choose a free book to start mm -hmm. the summer. 
And then they can also take a look at the display in the youth area. I'm kind of keeping my eye out over here because I see some people admiring it right now, but we have all of the <laughs> raffle prizes on display. So they can come get amped up for the summer because they can see what they might win. And I, I know you've got a lot of great events planned. I think that the kickoff's coming up uh, end, of the, end of the week. It is, yes. So we're starting the summer reading challenge with a kickoff event this Saturday from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. That's gonna be in the town green and it's with the big blue trunk. Mm. Um, we don't have a rain date yet, but if it's rainy this weekend, we will publish that information as soon as we're able to reschedule. We also have a couple theaters coming by the summer. So we have Lyric Theater performing Ivy and Bean. We have um, the Very Merry Theater performing Annie Jr. And those are gonna be out on the town green also. And we have a couple science enthusiasts coming to talk to us about sharks and fossils or about pollinators. So we have a ton of people coming this summer. Um, and even a Vermont author, Angela Kunkel is coming to talk to us about her book that she published with Penguin. So a lot of ocean themed events and even some that aren't ocean themed. <laughs> A lot, as always, lots of good uh, events lined up for the library this summer. Um, yeah. Didn't remember uh, we had the pandemic the last couple of years, but I know we get really good participation in, in summer reading each year. It seems like. Yeah. So this is actually I'm very excited. This is my first year doing a summer reading challenge here, and the enthusiasm so far has been wonderful. <laughs> So it looks like, um, yeah, folks to get involved, get started, it's kicking off, um, and lots of opportunities for people to get uh, raffle prizes, ice cream cones, um, get a get a book to start out for kids. Um, mm -hmm. Any uh, any other pieces we didn't cover that that you want to share? Um, you know, just that it's also a really wonderful opportunity for teens to volunteer. So. Mm -hmm. Any teenagers who are looking for a couple hours to spend at the library each week, um, we are looking for volunteers just to help us give out the prizes during the summer as people earn their free books or ice cream vouchers or treasure chest toys. We would love to have, um, you know, someone helping us hand those out to make sure no one has to wait too long for their prize. Thanks for everything you're doing, Bonnie. I know there's a, there's a lot to coordinate here and um, especially navigating the, the oceans theme and all the uh, events and, and tracking and I, I think it's a great community event as always so thanks for thanks for coming on today and hopefully we'll we'll see a lot of folks around um, this summer um, participating yeah thank you and I, I hope to see everyone here participating <laughs> <laughs> thanks Bonnie thank you so to close out the program this month we've got a few town announcements to share the Select Board will hold a public hearing on a proposed development bylaw amendment to establish a form-based code overlay district and an official town-wide map at its July 5th meeting at 7.15 p.m. in the Beckett-McGuire meeting room at Town Hall. This will also be available over Zoom. This proposal is the end product of the My Taft Corners project that's been taking place over the past two years. To learn more and how to participate in the hearing, please visit the town website or stop by the Town Hall. And we're also gearing up for the town's annual Independence Day celebration. It's going to occur from July 2nd to July 4th. Activities planned to include the fun run, ice cream social and band concert, the parade, activities on the green, and culminate with the fireworks. Also, if you want to check out the town website for more information, and if you're interested in registering to be in the parade, all the information is available there, or giving our Recreation and Parks Department a call. So that's going to wrap up our show this month. It's great to be back on What's Up Williston. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you around town.